Thanks for joining us on the GovIT podcast today in our special Tech Trends Season 1 Highlights episode, Part 1. We covered a lot of interesting and critical information in Season 1, so today we're going to recap our overview of two very exciting technologies, Wi-Fi 6E and the Juniper Mist AI-based network management platform. So without further ado, let's dive in. So then my understanding of what's great about uh, 6E is that we have this whole new section of spectrum that's opened up, but it's wireless first and it's dedicated specifically to devices that are that are you know made for this this part of the spectrum. So there aren't there's not going to be any overlap or performance degradation from older devices, you know, fours and fives. And uh, there's going to be a lot more security, as I understand it, as well, because there are new secure, uh, security requirements and specifications. Uh, but then also because we're not sharing the spectrum with legacy devices, we're not bringing in um, you know, any kind of security vulnerabilities that come with those technologies. Is that, is that correct? Correct. I mean, we first just look at the, uh, the overlapping piece. So, you know, two, four had three non overlapping channels. So you're basically, you know, three devices streaming at once. Um, and they would kind of go on and off and share that, you know, different channels, and, you know, that increased with five, but now with, you know, six E you're getting five times that amount of five. So was it 10 or 12 times more of, you know, 2.4. And each one of those channels has an, uh, I think, 80 megahertz, you know, band. So you're stacking up a lot of different, you know, channel options. I think 14 total that are kind of dedicated within that big giant span of wow. you know, 80 megahertz. Mm -hmm. So it's a big increase of spectrum use. So that's going to facilitate a lot of the modern technologies and use cases that we, uh, you know, have such as the, the Internet of Things with multiple devices uh, accessing the networks, as you, you put it earlier. Um, also, augmented reality and virtual reality, um, remote learning, telehealth. Uh, what are some of the other benefits and use cases that uh, you think would be worth mentioning or talking about? All, all those are really good um, points. You know, you can even kind of bring in just the, the large meeting spaces that we have um, in a lot of facilities, um, if it's, you know, boardroom style or just kind of the, the meeting spaces in general, where, you know, you're looking at everyone bringing in laptops or a tablet or a phone, you know, so two to three devices per individual, you start stacking up, you know, 30 people in a meeting that's now 90 devices just in one wow. small, yeah. you know, little room. What are some of the other facilities or use cases that you could see this being really useful in? I mean, I've really kind of just see at this point, just the standard office space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now everyone is getting laptops as kind of the number one priority, especially with the work from home environment that we've been in the last few years, of, mm -hmm. you know, kind of bringing that device back home, back and forth. So if everyone's got a wireless device instead of the old PC setup where you're hardwired in, you know, just your standard cubicle farm or, you know, your office space that's fairly open, one of these devices will easily penetrate all those users. You know, still would highly recommend doing heat maps to make sure you got the coverage. But, you know, now that kind of green dot you would have on a heat map, you know, previously didn't really say how many devices that you were going to have within that certain area. Mm -hmm. You know, now we can start loading up those devices. So you wouldn't have to kind of do a retroactive heat map after it's kind of been deployed to see, okay, well, you know, where do we need to add APs now to have the coverage that it needs, not just the heat map signature. How can C1 Gov, how can uh, Converge One Government Solutions help customers leverage this new technology? And I guess as an extension to that, or maybe a different way of putting it is, um, how can you work with your customers to prepare them for, for this shift? Well, I see it as, as something that they need to start at a minimum planning for. Even if they don't have it on their radar today, it's something that they need to start planning for in the next year to two years to start getting the funding to be able to, to pay for the updated and upgraded, you know, wireless infrastructure. So, you know, that's going to be a site survey, doing heat maps, making sure that, you know, what is currently there, what is working, what's not working, and really looking at the security aspect of it too. So putting WPA3 into play, you know, that right there, just the security aspect should be the leading factor uh, besides the capacity of 60. If you plan ahead of time, you have a lot more in your control. It's sort of, you know, you're doing it on your own time frame. You, you have, you know, say in, in what goes down and how and when. Whereas if you, you know, kind of wait too late, then you're kind of under the gun and it gets a little, little messy, right? Right. Because the wor worst thing about something like this is, you know, a project is going to be put in play. Some new technology is going to come in. Uh, a big purchase is going to be acquired and then all of a sudden they put it out and they go, oh, it doesn't work because we don't have, you know, 6E enabled and all the security requirements that are needed for that. Um, so it's, you know, we got to put in the infrastructure first to be able to support all the new and upcoming technologies that are going to be put in play on a day-to-day -day use. Well, certainly security is going to be, especially in, you know, Fed SLED is going to be the, the probably the number one concern, right? Besides cost. Correct. I mean, you know, cybersecurity in general is a very um, big point right now to, to kind of discuss and really think through um, on the network. So with, you know, 6E in play now, we're talking about stronger encryption, 
improved authentication, kind of protection against, you know, brute force attacks, a little bit easier to configure. So, you know, that's also a, a big issue that I've seen lately. It's just configurations haven't been there that really need to be put there and applied on the overall security aspect. Um, and it also has protection for open networks as well. So that's an added benefit uh, that you would see. We have improved authentication that comes along with this as well. And and uh, so that was simultaneous authentication of equals, which is sounds very interesting, but uh, maybe needs a little uh, little uh, description. Yeah, so that's, you know, SAE. And it's also, you know, previously known as the, uh, the Dragonfly Exchange. Um, so as it kind of goes through the process, you're not using your passwords or your passphrases anymore to join. So it's a lot harder to attack the network and kind of guess, you know, access. This also adds even greater security because it takes some of the human uh, part out of it, right? Because there's no, we're not sharing passwords. Um, you know, some of the issues that might come along with um, implementation uh, go away uh, because a lot of this mm -hmm. is being uh, taken care of on the fly. Correct. I mean, if you look at, you know, kind of when you use passwords and, and passphrases, so there's generators out there that will just sit there and try all day long mm -hmm. to get into the network. Um, so now that takes that whole piece out of it. So the brute force attacks that you would see previously, you know, are now not part of it right. on the uh, WPA3 side. Um, you know, I understand that WPA3 is required for the enterprise side. What would be the application then for OWE? Yep. So OWE is for the open space network. So, you know, from your, your lobby side, your cafes, um, your conference rooms where you're going to have guests join. So when you kind of need that open network for, you know, non-enterprise related tasks, you know, basic internet access, that's where the uh, OWE would be in play. How is uh, transition being handled, right? Because there's, it's not likely that people are suddenly just going to switch from all 60, you know, from, from legacy devices and networks and WPA2 to suddenly overnight, we're all, you know, uh, 6E and WPA3, right? So, you know, it's kind of like network access control. You're going to be put into multiple sectors, depending on what your device is and how you're supposed to authenticate. And are you approved to go on to the kind of the next section? So if you have a, a five device, you're going to be put in WPA2, which is the original way we've been doing it for 10, 15 years with passcodes, mm -hmm. passphrases, et cetera. But it, if you go and penetrate that network, you're not going to be able to penetrate the devices on the WPA3 side because you're going to be hard blocked. The OWE side is just the open network side as well. So that really should just have a route to the internet and nothing directly into your enterprise. There's a lot of planning uh, and, and um, sort of pre-production uh, kind of work that needs to take place uh, before this transition can happen. Yeah, there is. So you definitely want to know, you know what devices you have that can be joined wireless. Are they six capable or are they going to be stuck in five? What's going to be your life cycle to cycle those out? So then, you know, at one point you're going to have open the transition mode up. So you're going to have WPA5, sorry, WPA3 and WPA2 attached to the same access point. You really want to go and get everything moved over as soon as possible to WPA3. So everything's on the sixth side. When it comes to the, you know, planning the transition, uh, you know, how can C1Gov help their customers with that process? and what does that process look like sort of in a nutshell? Well, let's kind of, you know, talk about that process. You really want to kind of, you know, do a nice layout, you know, figure out what your spectrum usage is in that area um, and then tag all the devices that are currently on the network mm -hmm. and then what that phase would look like, but also the spectrum in general. So, you know, the spectrum should be fairly wide open on that, you know, Wi-Fi 6 side because there's not too many devices or interference at this point. So it's controlling you know, what's really happening on the 5 side and what your transition is going to be. So as we put these new access points in play, it's one of those ongoing processes that we're going to have to go through to get you know rid of the old school, the WPA2 devices, mm -hmm. to move everything to WPA. Uh, yeah. Um, so Jim Bernice has a number of key features and benefits, you know, such as the AI-driven insights and automation capabilities that can help improve network performance, reduce costs. Uh, it also has advanced security features that help protect against cyber threats and ensure compliance. Even with regulations such as FISMA and NIST, um, you know, it's also going to be scheduled for FedRAMP moderate here in the very near future. So looking forward to that. Cool. And, um, you know, it sounds really interesting uh, that, that it's using AI for insights and for automation capabilities. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I'd like to understand more about how that works. Yeah, so Juniper misuses the AI to detect and troubleshoot issues in real time, reducing the need for manual intervention. Um, it can also provide predictive recommendations, real-time visibility, analytics to optimize network performance, prevent issues from occurring in the future. All of this kind of leads to increased uptime, reduced mean time to resolution, which helps organizations stay away from potential issues. You know, ensures that their network is always operating to peak performance 
uh, maximizing users' experience. People have concerns about AI. Uh, and what role it's going to have in terms of jobs and, and things like that. But you know, one of the one of the uh, I think arguments that I hear for AI is that it you know particularly just that that it allows people to uh, be relieved of some of the mundane stuff that takes up a lot of our time every day, so that we can focus on more important things uh, that, that require yeah. our attention. And, and you know, when you're looking at troubleshooting, you kind of have to do the layer approach sometimes of you know isolating to a certain point, and that just takes time to go through those processes. Mm -hmm. You know, we're now where you're kind of using AI to do most of that work and then provide you, you know, with a, a predictive recommendation uh, based on the results that the AI sees and recommendations on how to approve the network from that standpoint. Can you tell me a little bit about how um, Juniper Mist uh, increases and improves network uh, security? Yeah, well, it uses, you know, advanced encryption techniques. It's got intrusion um, prevention and detection, network segmentation. It also, you know, integrates access and security controls to protect against your cyber threats. Um, it can you know, detect and respond to threats in real time, you know, minimizing the impact of any potential security breaches. It really allows you to kind of go in there and, and get rid of that security breach you know, faster than, than normally. Uh, based on our conversation that we had last time about Wi-Fi 6E security, uh, you know, there's obviously a, a growing trend in uh, improving security protocols and standards that are being used in these new technologies. It almost sounds like Juniper Mist would be a perfect pairing uh, in the transition to, uh, you know, a 6E uh, network, would that be a, a correct assumption? Uh, so yes, you know, Juniper Mist supports Wi-Fi 6, you know, also known as uh, 802.11ax. Wi-Fi 6, you know, is the next generation of Wi-Fi technology. We've been talking about that the last couple episodes, um, which, you know, is really kind of designed for faster speeds, higher capacity, proved reliability compared to the previous Wi-Fi standards based on the new spectrum that it's in. You know, the Cloud-based architecture um, for Juniper NIST, you know, the artificial intelligence capabilities are all well suited for Wi-Fi 6. Uh, last time we talked about uh, the fact that Juniper uses AI to generate insights and, and help automate some of the uh, network administration tasks, frees up resources uh, to focus on higher level uh, strategy uh, related tasks and other things. Uh, this week we're gonna talk about scalability, flexibility, some use cases for federal and civil. And um, uh, do you want to get us started on, on scalability and flexibility? Sure, that's the easy one. I mean, so, it, you know, you're talking about a product that is now cloud-based architecture. So very easy to scale, get going, you know, put in place, even for like a, a proof of concept that a small scale is easy to do. A very large scale is easy to do. So the fact that it has the automation capabilities to, you know, provision some of your devices makes it really easy to scale, especially when you're doing a large deployment. Uh, you know, some of our locations that we're dealing with supporting 20,000 plus users on a base. Uh, that's a lot of access switches, a lot of distribution switches that we're you know putting out there per building. So when we're going to be touching hundreds of buildings, you know, within a campus, this really helps just scale that up. So you're using a lot of smart hands to rack and stack cable, put it in, and then the automation, you know, happens on the back end being pushed for the controllers from the cloud. So it really helps kind of scale that to do it, you know, a lot quicker than we previously were able to do it. And just really adds simple configuration that you know you're not going to mess up from an individual standpoint by touching every single switch. Why don't we talk a little bit about uh, some of the use cases for government and civil agencies? Well, yes, with a lot of those agencies, I mean, we have, you know, complex configurations, you know, a lot of different strict security needs that, that can be put in place. So putting these um, profiles, you know, in place for the different organizations that you're going to touch, different departments, and easy to push down, you know, really helps control those security requirements. Um, so now we can, you know, take it down to the switch level, the port level, gives, you know, strict access to what the requirements are, you know, for the end user or the department. Uh, really helps from a command control perspective of helping those, you know, security policies be pushed correctly. Now we're dealing with a lot of new hardware requirements. Um, you have your topology that you've created and and uh, the access, uh, the, the network uh, requirements assessments and now policies and configurations. How do you take all of these things, put them together and into a cohesive uh, plan or strategy for, for rolling this out? Well, there's a couple couple things that we do. You know, being able to prove of concept this in the lab, making sure everything is working correctly. Uh, we also have the ability to mass stage uh, everything in the lab before it's actually shipped to site, which is good because then you should know at that point you're gonna be racking and stacking and kind of rolling into the project and everything should be set in stone configuration wise. You know, the real key piece to this that I've seen a lot of these large projects kind of run into is really the, the layer one infrastructure. 
is having issues. So like I said in the beginning, kind of figuring that out, making sure that we have a plan to address the infrastructure, the layer one uh, aspect of all this is key in power. And we, we recently covered Wi-Fi 6E and we talked a little bit about it, I think in the last ex episode as well. If, if customers or, or clients, partners are looking to possibly do a shift to both of these at the same time, is that something that's possible or would you recommend it or no? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, we're ready to do proof of concepts, uh, demos. If clients want to come get their hands dirty, we can, you know, get that set up as well. So it's a really good time to kind of deep dive into it, uh, figure out the strategy, you know, for this year and next year. Yeah. If I want to really deploy 6E, what it's going to be about, what's going to work, what's not going to work. And is it really set up, you know, to enable the, the future needs and requirements? So we're going to take a break there for today. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next week when we talk about the United States' plan for evolving and securing the digital domain and economy, as well as the crucial topic of technical debt and the challenges it poses to our organizations. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel, and if you found this episode helpful, please give it a like and hit the notification bell to get updates from us in the future. Stay ahead of the curve, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.